Well, good to see you back tonight. And uh, we had a couple of visitors this morning. I've been uh, getting those visitors' cards out. We have these cards in the back. And the visitors uh, pack it, and it says here we had a man named uh, Gregorio. His name is really goes by Peter. He said, that's what my mother calls me, a Bible name. Peter Matutino, and he lives right across the street in the building there, where a lot of these kids come from. And then uh, Marvin, Marvin Nozaki. And Marvin was here this morning, and he likes to talk. And uh, he lives in Wailua, right? Wailua? I guess uh, he's uh, looking for a church as well, both these adult men. So keep them in your prayers. What I've been doing is uh, I, I typed up a letter, and I made a letterhead for our church, Bethel Bible Church. Tomorrow I'll go to my office and send them a letter, thanking them for visiting with us and putting down the times of our service. Little, very, you know, just a little note about the church, and if I could be of any service, call me. And I mail it to them, and uh, we shall see. It's good to have visitors, and we hope that they will, especially if they're looking for church, that they would consider coming to uh, our church. Why not, right? Why not? Well, we're going to start a new series tonight, so turn to Acts chapter 1. It's good to see these little girls here tonight. These girls uh, started coming to church when uh, Susan and Hal they, and, and uh, Lynn Baconis went to the building and had the Bible clubs, which we still do. And uh, they were there the other day, too, on Wednesday. And they were helping me. They're very good helpers, these girls, right? And they uh, enjoyed the popcorn and the punch that I made for them. <laughs> All right, Acts chapter 1, and Acts has 28 chapters, you know, and uh, I believe that the book of Acts is like an unfinished book that we're in the still in the New Testament dispensation of grace. So tonight we'll start what's called an inspired history, and we'll, we'll look at uh, some of the beginnings here. We did a little bit this morning, but finished up on the life of Christ, transitioning into the Acts of the Apostles. So Acts chapter 1, verse 1 says, The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Former, I believe, meant the Gospel of Luke. Because he mentions, and we'll see in the message today, in Luke, he mentions Theophilus as well. Then it says in verse 2, Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Verse 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And that was, of course, the, the mind of the Jewish mind, restoring the kingdom. And he said unto them in verse 7, It's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Verse 9, when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, saying, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. In verse 13, the final verse, when they were come in, they went into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon Zelotes and Judas, the brother of James. We'll stop right there. This is the Acts of the Apostles and uh, it's the continuing work of Christ in the New Testament through the Holy Spirit and through the local church. And some things that we're going to talk about and see in this book is it's a book of transitions, a link or a transition between the Judaism of the apostles who were Jewish and New Testament Christianity as a transition. 
a book of transitions between Old Testament law and the New Testament grace. A transition between the life of Christ in the Gospels and the Christ life that's taught in the epistles. And it begins with the so-called new movement, uh, with a handful of Jewish believers in the new, early New Testament church here in Jerusalem where they're at, and ends 28 chapters later with this gospel of grace taking hold throughout the entire Roman Empire and becoming a worldwide faith. And it's more than anything, this book, a book of action, a book of verbs. And because the believers are scattered abroad, they are doing, it's action and doing, and doing what Jesus commanded in the Great Commission. And because it is a book of transition and action, some of the things that we're going to read about are unique to that time period. And when we get to that, we'll talk about all that. And then one of the things you see in Acts is a, is a, a study of contrast of two important people, Peter and Paul. <laughs> Peter, the apostle to the Jews, was the Palestinian Jew. Paul, known as the apostle to the Gentiles, he was a Hellenistic Jew from Tarsus in Bithynia. One, Peter, unlearned fisherman. The other, you could say a scholar, Paul, trained by Gamaliel. One, a personal disciple of Christ who walked with him, Peter, and the other, an apostle born out of due time. We believe uh, the human penman uh, was, of course, Dr. Luke. And if you look at Acts chapter 1, verse 1 there again, he wrote, The former treatise I have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. And again, we believe the former treatise or writing was the Gospel of Luke. And Theophilus, uh, if you'll try to check out who was he, it doesn't say much about him, but judging by the name that he was given, he was probably a Greek believer. What we do know is that he held in his hand at one time a letter that was written by Dr. Luke that has become part of the canon of Scripture. So we believe, of course, it's an inspired letter. Uh, if you look at Acts chapter 1 again, this book out of here, verse 1 and 2, he said, the former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began to do and to teach until the day that he was taken up. After that, he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles, <coughs> excuse me, whom he had chosen. So go back to the former treatise. <laughs> Luke chapter 1 and verse 1, if you just turn back there quick. There's a bridge, again, between the Gospels and the book of Acts, between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But if he was the writer, we want to see what he said. Luke 1, 1, he said, For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, write unto that same person, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. This is the opening of Luke's letter to Theophilus. Luke, I believe, discipling, instructing Theophilus, again, a Greek convert, and Theophilus writing this down, maybe, again, unbeknownst to him, but it's going to be one of the bridges from the gospel record, Luke, the former treatise, to the book of Acts. Luke 1.5 starts out saying there was in the days of Herod. And here uh, Luke is about to begin his former treatise about the life and ministry of Christ. He ends it in Luke 24.49 through 53. He ends the gospel, the former treatise, this way. So it begins with in the days of Herod. He's about to talk about the beginning and Christ's birth. And throughout the book, in the end of Luke 24, 49, he says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. We talked about it this morning. What was the promise? The Holy Spirit. But tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, lifted up his hands, this is Christ, and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And we're continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. That's how Luke ends. Acts chapter 1 and verse 2 says, Until the day which he was taken up. After that, he through the Holy Ghost gave commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 
40 days, speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father. Same almost exact wording. Which saith he, ye have heard of me. So, the Gospel of Luke ends with the promise of the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts begins with the promise of the Holy Spirit. And that's important. Because Jesus ascended, and he's seated now at the right hand of God, making intercession for us, preparing a place for us. And for the plan and the work of God that Jesus began to do and to teach, for it to continue, God must send his Holy Spirit, right? To continue that work. He didn't end. The, the Acts and, and, and Luke did not end anything. He began. <laughs> For the work of Christ to continue, we as God's people are going to need a power, and they needed a power they didn't have. They were going to need a friend. We said a comforter this morning, a teacher, and a guide. Of course, Christ had to go. It was expedient. Make note of this, too. At the end of the book of Acts isn't the end of the work of Christ. <laughs> I feel it's an unfinished book. It's the continuing work of Christ into and including the church age, which we're still living in. It's the continuing story of the New Testament church as we go out obedient to the commands and preach the gospel of the saving grace of Christ till he returns. Acts, the last verse in Acts, Acts 28, 31 says, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no man forbidding him. <laughs> I don't know about you, that doesn't sound like an end of a book. It sounds like dot, 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 you know, and, and on it goes. What he's saying is there's another page to be turned, and it has been turned, and it is being turned tonight right here in this church. The Gospel of Luke starts again in the days of Herod, ends with Jesus ascending, and the book of Acts is a bridge with Jesus ascending in the beginning, and it the very same Jesus. It's an unfinished story. And when the book of Acts ends, it's as if to say you need to turn a page to continue this adventure and say, what's next, Lord? Let's look at Acts chapter 1 again, verse 3. I want you to see this. To whom it says Jesus showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Luke establishes here right away in the beginning of the book that Jesus who was crucified is not dead, all right? To whom he also showed himself alive, all right? Reminding Theophilus and us of the infallible proofs of that fact, including that 40 days he showed himself. That word being seen of them, being seen, if you looked at the original language of the Bible, was the Koine Greek. It's the word ophthalmalia. Does that sound familiar? Sound, we get the word ophthalmologist from that, or an eye doctor. That word being seen literally means to eyeball someone. Doctors would use it as a figure of speech. Luke, of course, was a doctor, and the best way we could say it today would be that for 40 days they eyeballed Jesus. <laughs> they watched him. They scrutinized him. They, they touched him. They talked with him, and most of all, listened to him. Being seen. I like that. Ophthalmia. Now, the book of Acts was written, uh, I believe, A.D. 62, 60 years after the birth of Christ. In Luke chapter 1, back in the gospel, we have the incarnation of Christ being written about. In the book of Acts, again in transitions, we have also a birth. A newborn, mostly Jewish, New Testament church was being born. They were going to throw off the grave clothes of Judaism and put on the new robe of grace. This is what it's all about. One Bible commentator said the book of Acts is the weaning time of Isaac, a transitional book in the plan of God. And whenever the plan of God is moving forward, and this is a huge step forward, the enemies of God also come forward to try to oppose it. One of the greatest uh, enemies of the gospel are the Jews that did not believe. <laughs> and, uh, and it's described in Acts chapter 17, verse 6. They came to this conclusion when they saw what God does and what he does to his people. This is what the enemies of the gospel said. These, talking about the disciples, that have turned the world upside down, are come here also. <laughs> They're coming to our town. 
In other words, how can this small band of unlearned, mostly unlearned men, turn the empire upside down? Because they did it through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Acts chapter 1 verse 4 says, And being assembled together with them, Jesus commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait. Wait for the promise of the Father. This is the Holy Ghost, which ye have heard of me. You know, waiting is a very difficult thing sometimes. <laughs> for people, it's difficult for Christians too. We're supposed to be patient, I know that. They were waiting for the promise of the Father. What promise? He promised an outpouring of the Spirit of God. You say, that's just in the New Testament. You know, that was prophesied in Joel chapter 2, Isaiah chapter 40 and 44, Zechariah chapter 4. Jesus mentioned in the Gospels about this promise throughout, especially John 14 and 16 chapters. So you, in a real sense, they weren't waiting for 40 days, all right? The Jews, they've been waiting for 40 centuries, you could say. People of God have been waiting for this promise that goes way back to the Old Testament. And here they are for over a month, 40 days waiting, where? The most dangerous city for them in the world, Jerusalem. When he said, wait, tarry, that word means stick around in the Greek. They were told to literally stick around Jerusalem until they were endued with power from on high. Do you know that they didn't know what was going to happen? They just obeyed. Jerusalem, the most dangerous place for these men. It was like telling today in modern times a Jew whose leader was killed in Saudi Arabia for blasphemy to stick around in Mecca for a month or two and wait. Stick around where these anti-Jewish people are waiting to kill any of this leader's followers. And there was a reason why they couldn't go back to Galilee. They had to stay in Jerusalem. That was the city where Jesus died. He was crucified. The city of his resurrection. The city that there fleeing denials and cowardice were seen before all men who thought Jesus is dead and buried and all his followers are leaving him cowards and this uprising is all finished they thought Jerusalem was the city of prophecy it would all begin there what what would begin you know there's a 3,000 year old promise all the way back to Abraham it was told in Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 here's the promise Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. This promise would begin in Acts chapter 1 and 2 and spread to all believers, Jew and Gentile, empowering them to live this new Christian life. A life of grace that would empower them to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. That was the command. So Jesus told them, tarry, wait, stick around in Jerusalem. They had the great commission. He already gave it to them. It was given Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. They had it, but he said, not yet. Wait, tarry. Don't try to start churches. Don't try to go out and preach and win people to Christ yet. And they may have wondered, why wait? You know why? Because their enemies of the gospel are real. We saw it when Jesus was crucified. Their hatred is real. And these disciples that Jesus had just left and ascended, they're going to have to wait. You know why? Because they need, they need the Holy Spirit to remind them what they've been taught, to guide them, to empower them, to comfort them, and to help them. That's why they had to wait. Acts chapter 1, again, verse 3, look at what it says again. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Stay in Jerusalem. A baptism is going to occur, unlike the baptism that they heard about, John's baptism. Acts chapter 1, verse 4 says, Being assembled with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, whom he saith, you've heard of me. Then he said this, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. <laughs> All those symbols of the Old Testament of the Holy Spirit, and there were many, such as Aaron's rod that budded, 
the oil that ran down the priest's head when they anointed the priest into the priestly ministry. The candlestick in the tabernacle that lit a picture of the Holy Spirit. Zechariah's two olive trees. Ezekiel's river. The baptism of John itself. And all these pictures and others are about to be fulfilled. And in their minds, they don't understand it again. They are beginning to think about Jesus establishing the kingdom again. Acts chapter 1 verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And whatever you do now, you know, cannot miss the next part of the message here, because if you don't understand this part in the book of Acts, and there's much that you'll never understand in the rest of the book. What happens in this question and answer exchange, when they hear about the anointing of the Holy Ghost and think it's the rest restoration of the kingdom, they want to know if at this time of the Spirit's coming that the kingdom of Israel would be restored. And what was Jesus' answer? Acts chapter 1 verse 7. He said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father had put in his own power. It's not for me to say. No, it's not for you to know. <laughs> Wait a minute. First of all, this is not a rebuke. A lot of times... Don't ask that question. No, it wasn't a rebuke for asking them about the kingdom. It was a legitimate question. Je they already had faith in what Jesus said about the kingdom. He taught a lot about it and what it was going to be like to sit on thrones and so forth. He's not rebuking them for asking about it. But the timing of this is rather Jesus agreeing there would be a literal kingdom. And of course, someday they will. If there was not, he would have told them. But that's not what he said. What he said was very simple. And the only thing they needed to hear at that time, that there's something new, something mysterious, uh, hidden in the Old Testament, and it's about to begin right here in the plan of God. And later in the epistles in the New Testament, we learn about this mystery. But bear in mind, they didn't have any of that truth yet, these disciples. Paul hadn't even been born yet. He's the one that God revealed many of these truths, these mysteries in the epistles. So you see, Jesus knowing many of them don't understand he tells them that the timing of the kingdom has been determined by God the Father, and you don't need to know right now. And so it's not time for the literal kingdom to be restored. Well, then what is it? And if you put yourself in their shoes, they're hiding. They're not preaching openly yet. Jesus told them to wait in the dangerous place, Jerusalem. Now what? No kingdom? Uh, are we going to be martyred in Jerusalem? Maybe crucified like Jesus was? Is it a time for more waiting until the kingdom is established? Are we supposed to change and be political now? Change the world through politics? Maybe they're thinking that. Are we supposed to start businesses and change the world through economic power? Or maybe education or social programs? What is our calling now? What are we supposed to do now that Jesus left? Well, Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And here's what it is. Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Witnesses unto me is the key word here. We're not supposed to be talking about social ills and social injustice. It's him, Jesus, we're supposed to be talking about. He is the program. Eleven unlearned Galilean men have just been told they're going to take the gospel to the uttermost part of the earth without a physical kingdom. In fact, Jesus is gone. He's going to be in heaven. There's no restored Israel. We're going to be witnesses all the way to the uttermost part of the earth. Think of how this must have sounded to their ears. It's no wonder that they needed, like we need, the power of the Holy Spirit of God. They needed his comforting presence. You know, Jesus said he had to go away. We looked at that this morning. So he could send the comforter. Jesus, while on earth, as a human man, as, he's the God-man, we know that, but he can only be in one place at one time. What he was telling them, if he leaves, I will send the Holy Spirit so that I could be everywhere you go. <laughs> I will be with you everywhere to the ends of the earth. You understand? We go everywhere and he's with us. Acts chapter 1 verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, that was the final marching orders. <laughs> While they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? 
This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. Why stand ye gazing? How long are you going to stand there and look? This was a, an event in the history of the church. Jesus' bodily ascension. He's in heaven and he's mediating for us right now, tonight. He's coming again. <laughs> look at verse 12. They returned, then they returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. When they were come in, they went up into an upper room where abode Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, Zelotes, and Judas, the brother of James. Here they are, the group that's going to turn the world upside down. Small group. So God can take little things and do big things with it. You know that? In that upper room, you know what? They don't know anything about what's going to happen in the days of ahead in the book of Acts. We have it now. We, we read about it now. They had no idea. They don't know about 3,000 that are going to be saved when Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost. They don't know that. They don't know about Stephen, one of their own, being stoned, the first martyr in the church. They don't know about Paul yet and his epistles. <laughs> Paul's still going to be known as Saul of Tarsus. None of the epistles have been written yet. They know nothing about the church in Corinth or Ephesus or Antioch. They don't know what pastors and deacons and elders or missions or offerings or even communion as we know today. Nothing. They only know one thing. Jesus is alive, resurrected, and ascended. And somehow, some way, we are going to be empowered by the Spirit of the living God. And go tell the whole world about Christ. And they also know another thing, that the same Jesus is going to come back the same way they saw him leave. <laughs> so very interesting what lies ahead in the book of Acts with its twists and turns and all the way up to right now. January 28th tonight, 2018 at Bethel Bible Church. You know what? The baton has been passed to us. And it doesn't matter what the world, the flesh, or the devil can do to us. <laughs> He's still working in the world. And the most important thing going on in central Oahu tonight is what's going on here in this place between us and other churches like us. We are doing a part of the program that Jesus started way back, <laughs> as we'll read here in the pages of Scripture. As we study uh, the book of Acts in the days ahead, it's, it's a very exciting journey of this transitional time in the New Testament church. Again, between Old Testament Judaism and New Testament grace. The Jews, which have a history, a small group of them followed Christ, became the first Christians, you could say, believers. Filled with the Spirit, they waited, just like he said. They were obedient. They didn't have any idea what was going to happen in the days ahead, but it happened. We always like to think of New Testament Christianity kind of like a virus, like a, like a spreading of germs just going everywhere. People giving out the gospel, spreading the seed of the gospel from person to person, man to man, woman to woman, child to child, until it reaches the uttermost part of the earth. We don't know. We, we have an idea, maybe a rough idea. And I believe in our day that the Lord will return everything that had to happen and prophecy with Israel has happened. But he said, we don't know. We just keep doing what he told them to do. <laughs> just be obedient. And so that's our desire, of course. That's our prayer that we be obedient followers of Christ. As we attempt by his grace, filled, filled, important, filled with his Holy Spirit. To just simply obey and evangelize the world until he comes. There may be somebody that God has as that, that's, if that person, if that number, I don't know what it is, is saved, that's it, and he's coming back. Maybe we'll be one of the people to lead someone to Christ, and the Lord will say, that's it! <laughs> the trumpet will blow, will be taken up. Christ will return. There's going to be seven years of tribulation. We know that. And then we will come back with Christ, riding on white horses. <laughs> 
and we are going to be here for at least a minimum to start out with the thousand year millennium there's a new heaven a new earth will rule and reign with christ and then there'll be the final eternal eternity with christ forever and ever again uh, not able to comprehend with our human minds but it's a promise that we have amen i know about you i'm looking forward to a study i always love and enjoy studying about the early new testament church <laughs> We, we could say we're the late New Testament church. I don't, I don't want to use the words that the Mormons use because, of course, we, we don't believe in the doctrine of the Mormons. They call themselves Latter-day Saints. Yeah. First of all, you have to be a saint. You have to be saved to be even called that. The Bible calls believers saints, and we are. We've trusted Christ. We've been born again. We're sanctified. That word saint doesn't mean we're some special person that people will make statues of us and pray to us and light candles to us. No, we're separated unto the gospel. We're new creatures and there's a, we're something different about us. And so we may not be thought of even thinking of ourselves as saints, but that's how God sees us. You know why? Because the righteousness of Christ now has been imputed into us. And so when God sees me now, he doesn't say, ah, look at Frank Cuso's past or his life. He doesn't see my sins anymore. They've been wiped away. He sees the record of Christ, his perfect sinless record. Hard to believe, hard to imagine, but that's what it says. Justification. Just as if I'd never sinned, Pastor Sexton would say, he doesn't see us that way. He sees us just as if we were never even a sinner. And that's good to know, because that's the only way we get into heaven, on Jesus' record, his perfect spotless record non-blemished record well let's pray tonight i hope you uh, make your way here on sunday nights at six each week we will be going through the 28 chapters of the book of acts and it's like i say i love it it's very exciting and and a lot of times when i study this i'll always say to myself why isn't that happening today <laughs> we have the same jesus yesterday today and forever the same holy spirit the same god that never changes well, it's not God's fault, I'll tell you that. And we're going to look through the book, and uh, I get excited about it, and hopefully it'll stir us uh, to, do, to be obedient like they were. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that we hold in our hands the word of God, which is, of course, to be studied and read, but to be obeyed more than anything else. Thank you for this group of people. Thank you for this church. You've placed us in this area for a reason, Lord, to just be obedient believers to carry out the gospel message to this community and to the othermost part of the earth. Help us, Lord, help us to do that. We, we ask that you fill us with your spirit, empty us of self, each one of us individually, Lord, as we go to our homes, maybe tonight, maybe in the morning, first thing on Monday, to, to pray each and every day, to be filled with your spirit and to be emptied of self. Why? So that we can better be obedient to your commission, to your commands. Lord, we're excited to learn and see about what happened in the past, but we, we are concerned about the present as well as you are. So help us, a small group as we are and a small group as they were, that you turn the world upside down. Lord, we want to turn Hawaii upside down for Christ. Really, we do. And Father, we know you want that as well. And so... Lord, we want to dedicate ourselves to doing that. So help us, use us, empower us. May we see powerful things, not to glorify ourselves, but to glorify you. So, Father, be with us as we head home now. Keep us all safe. Bring us back again on Wednesday for our prayer meeting and Bible study. We'll thank and praise you in advance for what you're doing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, folks. You're dismissed. <laughs>